uh, now uh, let us open our Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 4, and beginning at verse 1. Matthew 4 and 1, uh, and uh, for the last time, um, well, almost the last time this, this service, uh, would you please rise if you're able for the reading of Scripture. We're only going to read four verses, so it'll be quick. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. You may be seated. Would you bow your hearts with me, please, for just a moment? Blessed Father, in these next few moments... May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto you. O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Now, before we begin, uh, let me say that I realize this message is going to feel like a long and ambling journey. I do realize that at times it will actually feel like wandering in the desert. Let me assure you, No matter how it feels, this is one of the shortest messages I've ever delivered at Frankfurt United Methodist. The trip through this one, though, hits some points which are, I think, very necessary to begin to understand what's going on in Christ's temptation. Now, last week we read the passage immediately preceding this one regarding the baptism of Christ. I mentioned how I had also used that same passage in January as part of my sermon series on the doctrine of the Trinity, and it is, I think, important to remember these things as we move into this chapter. That is, the idea of the Trinity, the idea of the baptism, both the divinity and the humanity of Christ. In our text last week, we saw not only the baptism of Christ, but the presence of the entirety of the Trinity in that same moment. The Father speaking from heaven. The Son walking up from the water. And the Spirit descending on the Son like a dove. His divinity, then, is an important aspect of what we are to remember in the coming passages. We like to think about Jesus... Uh, as he, as the Son of God, right? As this divine, powerful prophet and miracle worker, and we love to remember the stories of, of his of his wondrous works, and especially his resurrection, which brings us defeat over death. We love to talk about his amazing deeds and wonderful teachings, and all of these things are evidences that he is, in fact, God incarnate. But in our primary text. Today, we see something we don't often see in Scripture. We see his humanity. We're reminded in a very immediate way that while he was indeed God, he was also very much man. Matthew says, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. One of the things I love about the Bible is its ability to understate things. I suppose that's part of the culture in which it was written. But after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry seems to be the height of understatement. I once fasted for three days. Hungry just didn't seem to be a good enough word for the way I was feeling. The way the human body is designed by God is a fascinating thing. I remember reading stories of the Native Americans when the European explorers first arrived. And their natural diet was treacherous. There would be times of plenty when they could have all the food that they wanted. And there would be periods of famine where there was not enough food for anyone. And they would go weeks or or, or days or weeks without eating. 
Their bodies adapted to this because God designed them to be able to do so. When a person goes without food, the first few days are the hardest, up to a certain point. Your body wants to keep things as they have been and will do everything it can to convince you to eat during those first few days. But then around the third or fourth day, your body will switch to what's called a conservation mode and will begin to consume the fat in your cells to sustain and power itself. I've seen testimonials on the internet of people who are doing a water-only fast, and their stories are really quite remarkable. One story I listened to, the fella had gone 30 days without food and claimed not to be hungry. He agreed that the first three days were the hardest up to that point. But when you hit that 40-day mark, your body goes into panic mode. Jesus spends 40 days in the desert. Now, since a person can't live more than three days without water, we can safely assume that Jesus drank water while he was in the desert, but he ate no food. When Satan came to tempt him, he was physically at his weakest. His body had consumed at that point all of its fat reserves. At the 40-day point, there's nothing left, and the body will begin to consume its own organs. Liver and kidneys will start to shut down to provide some nourishment for the body, and with no fat left, the body will begin eating the muscles and the organs, trying to stay alive. This is the point Jesus had reached. This was his 40-day mark. This was when Satan chose to strike. Now, before we continue, why did Jesus fast for 40 days? What's significant about that number? Well, what happened just before he did? Just before he fasted, he had been baptized by John in the Jordan. Jesus, living in Israel, probably in Nazareth, he goes to John in the Jordan. That is, he travels south and east about 60 miles to where John is baptizing. And where, along the Jordan River, was John baptizing? Right here. This is a site just two miles east of the city of Jericho and six miles south of the city of Jerusalem. John was baptizing right at this spot. Now, what other significant event happens at this spot? This is where Joshua leads the Hebrew people across to the Jordan River at the beginning of the conquest of Canaan. <clears throat> all through the Torah, all through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, Moses is leading the people through the desert. They're following a cloud of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night. They're going where God tells them to, and they come to this spot. Moses goes up onto the mountain and dies. The Lord buries him. Joshua leads the people across. We're going to read that scripture in just a moment. Oh, I'm going to read that scripture right now. Joshua chapter 3, beginning at verse 11. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is passing before you into the Jordan. Now, therefore, take 12 men from the tribes of Israel, from, from each tribe a man. And when the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the ark, the Lord of all the earth, uh, ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from flowing, and the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. So when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people, and as soon as those bearing the ark had come, in, come as far as the Jordan, and the feet of the priests bearing the ark were dipped in the brink of the water. Now the Jordan overflows its banks throughout the time of harvest. The waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarathon. And those flowing down toward the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off. Now the people passed over opposite Jericho. Now the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firmly on the dry ground in the midst 
of the Jordan, and all Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. The Lord stopped the waters at the feet of the priests. The priests stepped in, and the waters began to pile up next to them. How much water? All the way to the city of Adam. Where is that? Ten miles upstream. We're talking about more than two million people crossing over the Jordan River on that spot in the, in the previous slide on dry ground with the water piling up next to them. <clears throat> Joshua goes from within, I'm sorry, so Jesus goes from within Israel to the point where Joshua led the Hebrews across the river. And there, at that point, he is baptized by John. And as he goes out into the wilderness, God pronounces blessing on him, and the Holy Spirit descends on him, and Jesus does the journey of the Hebrew people in reverse. He goes from the promised land through the Jordan into the desert. How long is Jesus in the desert? Forty days. Why? Because the Hebrews were in the desert for 40 years. Jesus begins his public ministry by repeating the Exodus event in reverse. The Hebrews fled Egypt and passed through the Red Sea. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 and 2, Our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. From there, they went into the wilderness. The, the Hebrew people passed through the Red Sea. They went into the wilderness. How long were they supposed to be in the wilderness? A few months. The distance from Egypt... Next slide. This is a Google Maps. I was looking at this last night. The distance from Cairo at the Red Arrow to uh, the real Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia... Um, 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 Jebel al laws in the, in, in the Arabic, but it's, it's the real Mount Sinai. And then from the red arrow, Jebel al laws up to Jerusalem, all the way into the heart of Israel, is 790 miles. You can see it on the slide here. Google says that you can drive this whole trip in 17 hours. Not 40 years, 17 hours. We like to think that they were in the wilderness for 40 years because they got lost or Moses had bad directions or just the desert was so vast. But this is not at all the case. Why were they in the desert for 40 years? Because they rebelled against God. God sent them into the desert to take them to Mount Sinai so he could give them the law. After this, God leads the people to the Jordan River. He goes from Mount Sinai, boom, straight up to the Jordan. A straight trip. Moses sends in 12 spies, and 10 of them come back terrified. The land is beautiful and rich, they said, flowing with milk and honey. But the people there are giants. Numbers chapter 13 and verse 33 reads, And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim, and we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. We were tiny in their sight. We were weak and frail and, and, and insignificant. Numbers chapter 13 and verse 30, however, three verses prior, says, But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. There were two spies, Joshua and Caleb, who went into Canaan and came out with a good report. The rest of them refused to go in. Now, this is very important. So if, if you're sleeping now, if your neighbor's sleeping, wake him up for just a minute. God sends them back out into the wilderness for 40 years with the express stated purpose of letting that entire generation die off. Numbers chapter 14 and verse 34 says... According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, a year for each day, you shall bear 
your iniquity 40 years and you shall know my displeasure. I, the Lord, have spoken. Think about that. Don't miss this. They weren't in the desert for 40 years because Moses was bad with his compass or because the desert was so huge that it took them 40 years to walk across it. God led them into the desert to give them the law and then he took them directly to the promised land. They rebelled. They sinned against God and God sends them back out into the wilderness for 40 years. Jesus crosses the Jordan River in the same way the Hebrews crossed the Red Sea. He is baptized there in the same way, Paul tells us, the Hebrews were baptized in the Red Sea. He goes out into the desert for 40 days, one day for each year, exactly as the Lord declares in the book of Numbers. Following this same pattern, why did Jesus spend those 40 days in the desert? Because the people sinned. Jesus spends 40 days in the desert because the people sinned. Don't miss this. Jesus goes into the desert for 40 days because the ancient Hebrew people had sinned. They had rebelled against God and Jesus was going into the desert from the opposite direction to redeem what the people had done. He went into the desert to undo their sin. That's a familiar narrative. That's why Jesus came, is to deal with our sin. But let's end the story where we began it. Jesus is hungry. He's been in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, and he's starving to death. If he doesn't eat soon, he will die of starvation. And Satan comes to him and says, If you are the Son of God... Command these stones to become loaves of bread. Now, Satan is, of course, appealing to the human nature of Jesus, but what if it were you or me that he was tempting? And what if we had absolutely the power to do what he was tempting us to do? In my hunger, I might argue that the stones becoming bread was um, um, symbolic of uh, the manna that God himself shed on the people. The stones covering the ground, the manna covering the ground, and here I am to redeem the journey of the people of Israel. It makes perfect sense to me. Not only is it symbolic, and not only does it recount the journey, but also it feeds me because I'm hungry. And, what's more, it would prove to Satan that I was who I said I was, right? Where is the loss in this? But Jesus counters Satan by quoting Scripture. He says, from, um, he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. Now listen very carefully to these words. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Do you see the reference to the manna there? Even in his exhausted state, Jesus is fully aware of what Satan is trying to do. And even though we could argue that turning the stones into bread was fitting of the retelling of the Exodus event, Jesus here realizes a bigger truth. The people were never intended to receive the manna. They were never intended to be in the desert long enough to need it. The manna is God's provision for the people after they sinned. It was the sin of the people which brought the manna. They refused to follow God where he was leading. They refused to go into the promised land. They refused to listen to God and to Moses and to Joshua and to Caleb. And Jesus is correcting that. This is what he does. He comes to fix that which is broken. He comes 
to set right that which has been put wrong. He came to solve the sin problem and to fix all of us. Now, Jesus is tempted by Satan three times. We're going to have two more sermons in this series. And every time I'm going to forget that I just said this, I'm going to say it again, so you can stop listening now. Every time Jesus responds to Satan, he quotes from the book of Deuteronomy. Every time Jesus responds to Satan, he quotes from the book of Deuteronomy. When's the last time you read Deuteronomy? I love the Old Testament, and I have to confess, it's been a while. The book of Deuteronomy is the shield that Christ uses to defeat Satan in all three of his temptations. Maybe we should give it a look. Now, as we prepare our hearts for communion, let us look to the bread of life. Let us look to Christ Jesus, who came to fix those things which we have broken who came to undo our rebellion and balance the scales of justice, to set broken hearts and broken lives right, and to restore our relationship with God our Father. Christ comes with this one singular mission, to create us anew in order to bring us into that right relationship before God our Father. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and every sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Amen. Let's bow our hearts. Blessed Father, we thank you for the example of the temptation of Christ. We thank you, Lord, that even at his weakest, he stood strong that even in his hardest times, he quoted scripture to show us the way. Father, we ask that you would teach us to remain strong when things are difficult, when life is hard. Father, we ask that you would help us to fix our eyes on Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. In his holy name we pray. Amen.